what is this Black River Paddle all about? It's about making an impact by inspiring the good stewardship of our waters and our lands. It's about bringing these experiences to you in hopes of fostering a greater respect. We have a long and deep connection to our wild places. They fill us with a wonder, a curiosity. We have paddled down this river, camping along its sandy banks to experience this place of memories, to learn from and to understand our river so that we can protect what might be lost, not only within our wild places, but also within ourselves, within our youth and our future. So paddle along with us and get to know our Black River. The Black River is a designated state scenic river, beginning in the thousand swamps of Sumter County, flowing through Clarendon County, Williamsburg County, and into Georgetown County, into the Great Petey River and eventually making its way into the Winya Bay. It flows through cypress swamps and down the coastal plain, bordered by forests and rural farmland. It is marked by white sandbars and dark waters. Named for these sweet tea colored waters that are stained by the tannins released from plant materials. This river shows traces of its ancient past, along with teaching us the lessons in biodiversity and keystone habitats that are so important to our future. It goes without saying that this place is a unique gem, a sacred river that gives us a rare look at an untouched wild place. And it is great news that we can secure this place Important partners have come together to form the Black Scenic River Advisory Council and the Black Scenic River Project in an effort to place much of this river under conservation, to open up new areas, landings, parks, and allow for greater access, recreation, and education opportunities along over 70 miles of river. But as I've said before, greater access requires greater responsibilities. I believe that if we're going to open up access to this river, to those near and far, we need to make sure that visitors understand the story of this place, the important characteristics of this river that make it unique in this world, and why this river is so vital for the health of our entire coastal plain. It is crucial to all of us that this river be maintained in its natural state as a healthy, wild and scenic river, protected from development for future generations. Only through access and education that leads to responsible recreation of this river that we can hope to mitigate the negative impacts that increased access will bring. Hopefully, this river can help all of us better understand and appreciate our wild places. We begin our 90 mile journey in historic Kingstree, South Carolina at Gilland Memorial Park. Settled by Europeans in 1732, this landmark site on the Black River was noted for its giant white pine. Named the King's Tree, the town was then settled, the pine protected, starting off a heritage of preservation along this river that lasts until today. At the landing, we met Dr. Lewis Drucker, a King Street native and lifelong caretaker of the Black River. He shared with us his passion for this place, explained how important the river is to the people of Williamsburg County, 
and I can agree with him. I'm a native of Georgetown County, and I was lucky enough to grow up on the Black River and later on the Waccamaw River. I understand our deep human connection to these places. As long as people have been in South Carolina, people have been on the Black River, and it has truly shaped our culture. I fear that as we move forward into this technological revolution, we're losing connections to wild places, to the places that have shaped us spiritually. As we paddle down the river, we will turn our cameras on and focus our lenses upon the human connections and insights that we find along the way. I hope to share with you wild places that you've never seen, the wildlife, the environments, the people, the sights, the sounds, and I hope that you enjoy this journey. Natives love this place. You can see them fishing along its sandy banks, canoeing down the river, or enjoying a moment of solitude on a dockside. As we paddled down the river, however, we started to lose that connection to civilization. The sounds of the highway faded away, and we began to see sights and sounds of wildlife, or in this case, some domesticated ducks. We're on Black River in Williamsburg County, South Carolina. We're about one and a quarter mile down river from King Street. And this part of the river is always been cleaned up at least for five of the last six years by the King Street Lions Club because we knew that we have a beautiful river, but it's gonna take some taking care of and some maintenance. So we've cleaned it up every year. Now on this stretch of the river, I'm afraid we've got a pile of trash. If you look behind me here, you'll see some of what I'm talking about. This part of the river, as you come down below King Street, the flow comes straight into this shortcut. This is not the river here. The river is, makes a serpentine to the left here. And so in this part of the river, the deep water and the flow comes straight ahead. And so consequently, all the trash and the debris piles into this little shortcut here. That's why it piles up so dramatically here. The reason we also need to clean it up is because when we have low water like we do now, boats can't get through, whether they're fishing boats or kayaks, canoes, whatever, John boats fishing. And so if they try to go that way, there's no water. That's maybe a places in there where we'll have to drag these kayaks because there's only five inches of water. And so if we can make this area open and if we can keep it open without the debris and the trash filling in this area, we got a navigable river. Whether the water's up high and they can go in the river serpentine in that way, or whether the water's low and they can take the shortcut straight through here. It'll help paddlers, it'll help recreation, it'll help fishermen. Everybody wins if we can keep this part of the river clean. That's our challenge that we face today. The Black River is a keystone habitat, a keystone environment, one that if it were to collapse, all of the surrounding environments would collapse themselves. The Black River is a coastal plains river, and when the rains come, throughout the year or particularly during hurricane season, the cypress swamp surrounding this river will fill, absorbing the waters and allowing the floods to flow naturally to sea. In October of 2015, the residents along the Black River experienced a thousand year flood after Hurricane Joaquin dropped almost 25 inches of rain upon the region. This event caused river levels to rise almost 20 feet above what is shown during our paddle. This flood swept away infrastructure, destroyed houses, and its leftovers are still seen upon the river today but it's important to note that without these valuable wetlands, the flood would have been much more devastating. The great network of root systems along the river combat erosion and allow these sandy banks to remain intact. The Black River is also an important carbon sink. 
All of these cypress trees with their cypress knees capture carbon from the air and transport that carbon back into the soils of these swamps. This characteristic directly mitigates the human impacts on climate change, cleaning our air and waters, keeping our environments in check. So these are stone shelves. And if you look closely, this is actually a sediment layer that was once the bottom of the ocean. And all of these little brown bits all up in here, these are old fossilized seashells or old seashells that are in the process of becoming fossilized. And so this was the bottom of the ocean. This was a seashell layer and we're about eight feet under under the ground level so usually this is covered in with water but because of the um the tides they're so the water level so low right now we get to see this shelf but this is all a limestone sandstone uh seashell beds and you know that's an old fossilized shell right there and you can see where bits are you know breaking off right there there's one that's uh the sun's not good, but there's a fossilized shell. So pretty cool how when the water level's low, you get to see these different layers of sediment. Layers of the soil. We go from topsoil to sand into this sandy fossil bedrock. In seeing these ancient layers of sediment and rock, I can't help but to think back upon the natural history of this river, its wildlife, and the peoples that have inhabited it for millennia. First, let's go way, way back. I've mentioned that at one point in time, millions of years ago, the Appalachian Mountains were giant, jagged peaks, and the fingers of those mountains would have stretched down to this coast and met the sea. At another point in this river's distant past, this place was completely submerged and the bottom of the sea floor was right here. Even today you can still see the sedimentary layers of fossilized seashells along this river. During the last ice age, when glaciers covered almost one third of the Earth's mass, sea levels were drastically lower and our coastline stretched out hundreds of miles farther than its position today. Since that time, as the ocean levels have risen back, the Black River has been carving its way through sandstone, creating vast swamps and hundreds of sandbars along its way out to the sea. This was a time before man's imprint upon this river, and there would have been an amazing array of megaflora and fauna only some of which are still around today. If you could have paddled down this river in those times, you would have seen mammoth and mastodon swimming in the water, pulling up plants from the bottom or branches from willow trees to eat. Imagine the trumpeting of these woolly elephants as their young splashed and played in the sandy shallows. Giant beaver, the size of grizzly bears would have been another common sight along this river, as well as the American lions and saber-toothed cats that would be perching along its banks, ready to pounce on their plus-sized prey. Giant ground sloths, the size of modern-day elephants, would have made their way through pine savannas, eating cones and foliage or other plants that they come upon. The canopies, of these pine savannas and cypress tupelo swamps would have been alive with the chittering of thousands of Carolina parakeets and the hammering of the ivory-billed woodpecker would have been heard all up and down this river. When the first peoples arrived to these lands that we now call Carolina and Black River, they would have had an incredible abundance of wildlife to hunt and fish for. 
and also plenty of natural resources like timber and chert to produce tools with. The latest archaeological and anthropological findings are now painting a new picture of the human habitation of the Americas. We are now sure that humans have been a part of this world far beyond the last ice age and the Bering Strait land bridge crossing. A handful of sites have popped up, one being the topper site in South Carolina along the Savannah River that are revealing stone tools and artifacts that are at least 50,000 years old. These findings are a triumph for all people as this gives a greater merit to our human ancestors that first explored the world so long ago. It is likely that in a time when sea levels were far lower, island chains would have stretched across both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, allowing prehistoric people from Africa and Asia to island hop in crude dugouts or sailing craft all the way to the Americas. These first people of this land would have fit the bill for our traditional hunter-gatherer culture. We call this the pre-Clovis and Clovis culture, who were known for their high craftsmanship quality of their stone axes, chert spear points, shell jewelry, and clay pottery. 50,000 years ago, they would have lived in semi-nomadic bands, keeping permanent camps at important sites along rivers, such as quarries or near significant food sources. However, as the seasons changed, they would migrate between inland rivers and coastal marshes, taking advantage of abundant natural food sources like fish, shellfish, fruits, nuts, grains, mushrooms, turtles, alligators, frogs, birds, and both large and small mammals. They hunted in small parties with atlatls and later bows, along with various trapping methods. They also would have gathered and even cultivated plots of regional plants like hickory nuts, muscadine grapes, berries, persimmon, maize, beans, and squash. With access to both land, the river, and the coast, early peoples along this river would have thrived and developed a culture far more sophisticated than what we give them credit for today. For literally tens of thousands of years, these people would have inhabited this coastal region, living and dying by the land, and eventually forming into the cultural groups that later met the first European colonizers. In the early 1500s, the first wave of Spanish explorers began to sail up the Carolina coast, and an early Spanish settlement named San Miguel de Guadalupe was founded in 1526 in the Winya Bay. This settlement was quickly abandoned as the Spanish were ill-equipped to handle a Carolina swamp during the summer season. With this first wave of Europeans came the great plagues of disease that would have swept through native communities across the continent and decimated many of the peoples and cultures of the Carolinas, many of whom would have never even known the existence of these European invaders. It was about 200 years later, in the early 1700s, when explorers like John Lawson or Mark Catesby made their voyages through this region, documenting the flora and the fauna, as well as the indigenous people that they came across. While Lawson and Catesby's writings are crucial to understanding our indigenous peoples of the Carolinas, it is very important to note that these peoples, the Chicora, Santee, Winya, Siwi, Witi, Pidi, Kataba, Edisto, and Yamasi would have only been a small remnant population of the descendants of the great undiscovered nations that were wiped out by the first European plagues in the 1500s. Although we don't have any great stone structures left behind, Large Indian mounds, leveled fields, and numerous shell middens still can be found in this region today. According to the accounts of Lawson and Catesby, written down a mere 300 years ago, many of the wild creatures that are gone today were still here then. At the time, giant millennial cypress trees would have filled these swamps, and they would have been full of the Carolina parakeets, ivory-billed woodpeckers, and passenger pigeons. 
Lions and tigers were said to have prowled these cypress swamps as well. However, it is likely that these big cats were the eastern cougar and jaguars that had migrated from the west. Large herbivores such as elk and bison were also still found in the Carolinas while the Europeans were beginning to map out this coastline. However, this would not last. As Europeans settled the Carolinas, moving up the Black River to found King Street in 1732, many of these great animals, from the bison to red wolves and Carolina parakeets, were hunted either to extinction or until they no longer existed in the Carolinas. When we are trying to understand the deep history of this place, we must take our lessons from the bits and pieces of knowledge that has been left behind for us. The indigenous peoples of Black River were much more in tune with nature than we are today, and the biodiversity of this river was far, far greater before European arrival. The peoples here would have lived in such a sustainable way that they would have left very little trace upon this river. And it wasn't until the Europeans found this river of Eden that we began to see the vast impacts and destructive changes to this wonderful environment. We might not ever know the true stories of the first peoples that lived along Black River, but we can examine what we do know. We can try to find connections with our past to our present on this river, and hopefully it will lead to more fulfilling and sustainable lives for ourselves, but also future generations. When experiencing this habitat of such biodiversity, with flora and fauna that remind us of times and lands long forgotten, one organism stands out along the Black River. Taxodium distichum, the bald cypress. In rare virgin stands, pockets of isolated trees that missed the axe and the saw blade, exist ancient, monolithic trees whose germination date could go back into the BCs. Dendrochronology, the dating of growth lines in large trees, is one of the most accurate methods of scientific dating. And new core sample data of similar sized cypress trees in the Three Sisters Swamp of North Carolina is resulting in some astounding news. Some of these great trees are over 2,000 years old, making them by far the oldest living organisms on the eastern coast of North America. These trees bring up a very serious question. How is it possible that in this flooding landscape in which devastating hurricanes make landfall, how could these trees survive so long? How could this elder that I have laid my hand upon have existed in the times of Christ? Well, it's their amazing adaptations and the connectedness of the natural world that they represent. Let me explain. Cypress trees form a root network, a web of roots that spread horizontally through the mud and then grow upwards, forming these cypress knees. These knees, which are the roots of ancient trees, can grow to be over six feet tall, and they interlock and merge underground with the roots of other cypress trees and even tupelos in this swamp. This forms a growing grid of roots that will stretch unbroken through the entire landscape. Like interlocking hands underground, these roots provide a network that supports this place. Many underwater creatures like otters, alligators, or catfish will make their homes in and among the submerged roots of these trees. This underground network acts like an anchor and it will hold the soil together, preventing erosion during the worst floods. It will also lock this forest in place when the hurricane winds tear up the coast. The trunks of these great trees are also adapted in a way that is called hydromorphic buttressing, creating wide and dense bases, 
allowing these trees to grow tall and strong in the soft mud. Taxodium disticum has a symbiotic relationship with many organisms in this ecosystem, interconnecting with other plants and fungi, but also with birds and mammals. Woodpeckers will burrow into these great trees and hollow out vast spaces within them. Amazingly, this does not kill the cypress. In fact, many of the oldest grand cypress trees still living are hollow all the way through. This creates invaluable nesting spaces for many birds like owls and the prothonotary warbler. Also, it creates homes for mammals like raccoons, foxes, and squirrels. These places are so important during the storm season as if a hurricane comes through the river, animals can hide within these caverns and be safe. In the tall canopy, you can find great nests of impressive birds, like the great blue heron, the osprey, or the bald eagle. Their seeds were also the primary food source for the now extinct Carolina parakeet. And they are an important seed for many birds and rodents on the Black River today. These trees are truly what create and define this environment. By protecting the forest from winds and erosions, by providing food and shelter for the many creatures from water to sky, and by witnessing, capturing the history of this place, which we can read in their inner rings. I'm here, it's 2022. We just made it through the pandemic. I made it through one of the toughest years of my life, spiritually, uh, emotionally. In the past decade, I've dealt with the loss of my mother and my father in different ways. But to come out here and to see a 2,000 year old tree or a 1,500 year old tree This is freaking amazing. I mean, to think about the people that have seen this, that have touched this. I mean, I'm only one person out here right now, but if you could go back 300, 400, 500 years when there were villages out here, when this, this creek that I'm on was a highway and it was when it was more managed, this would have been a landmark that they would have all stopped by and touched and prayed and worshiped. This is a representation of Mother Earth. This is a representation of this entire environment at its epitome. This massive organism that grows out of soft mud and withstands hurricanes for thousands of years. <sighs> we are so small, we are so insignificant, and we so much because these trees used to be everywhere. And now they're so rare. And I'm blessed to have found this, this spirit, this living representation of Mother Earth. I wanna thank you for this place. I wanna thank you for this wonderful ecosystem this world that you have given us for these ancient organisms and for the young organisms that we share this amazing world with I pray Lord that we can be better stewards of sacred places of all places in this world that we can take care of it that we can leave leave behind a better path for future generations to follow As I paddled away from this great tree, I spotted a few others, not quite as ancient, but still quite old, that were hollowed all the way through. It is this feature that saved these trees from the timber industry, as a hollowed out old tree has little value for lumber. Let me show you. 
We are out here in the swamps on this creek that is full of these beautiful ancient cypress trees. This is an old naturalized creek and uh, many of these trees missed the ax. This one right here could be 500, 600, maybe even a little older. Um, and I noticed at the bottom of this tree as we were paddling by, we've got this huge chunk missing. Now many of these trees are hollowed out. They're hollowed out by woodpeckers. Um, and so this tree has a hollow cavern going all the way up. And I'm very curious to know what is inside of this tree. With these really old trees, we know that ivory-billed woodpeckers and Carolina parakeets, which are our extinct beloved bird species here in the, in the Carolinas, they nested within these trees. And so possibly there could be layers of old nest, old debris within this tree. And just maybe, just maybe it's a slim chance, but there could be a 200 year old Carolina parakeet skull hidden within this tree. We don't know unless we try to look. So I'm gonna take this GoPro, I'm gonna send it inside this tree and uh, take a look around and see what we'll find. Now there could be snakes in here, there could be a raccoon living up in there, who knows? Uh, thousands of creatures call these trees home. So let's hope there's nothing in there that uh, can bite us. So it's hollow all the way to the top. You can see uh, the halo way, way up there. So this is a great example of how these trees, again, are hollowed out in the center. They're habitat for all sorts of animals. Uh, they give these animals protection during the storms, but also by being hollowed out, these trees lose a lot of their mass, yet they keep the structural integrity of the, uh, the circular structural design, right? And so that keeps this tree strong it keeps it resilient against storms and toppling and allows it to keep growing for thousands of years as a giant millennial cypress tree. Let's try to get back in there. Better vantage. So it's about maybe eight inches thick and then all inside it's completely hollow. Like I could stand up inside. Um, but the bottom's all water, so I'm not gonna even make that attempt. But if I can get a little deeper in. So many of the largest and oldest cypress trees have become completely hollow throughout. This process starts with the woodpeckers and other wood boring creatures that create hollows and caverns within these great trees. Over the centuries, water becomes trapped inside and contributes to the softening of the wood. Grubs and insects will eat through the softened xylem and phloem interiors while the exterior continues to grow strong and rigid. After centuries of water intrusion, insects and woodpeckers, we find a tree that is hollowed out top to bottom. And it is this feature which saved the oldest cypress trees from the ax as a hollowed out tree had little value as lumber. That is why we can still see some of these giant trees today and why most of them that we have access to are completely hollow through and through. So because it's hollowed all the way through, no nests, nothing like that in there, no Carolina parakeet skulls, but we'll keep looking. Uh, We'll never find one if we don't look, so. If I can get some service, I'm gonna play the sounds of the ivory-billed woodpecker. And then try to emulate it.
so that is what the ivory bill woodpecker sounds like. I'm someone who uh, I try to master calls in the wild. I can do a pretty good barred owl, but the ivory billed woodpecker, that is a new call that I'd like to add to my repertoire. So let's try that. bad right pretty good I'll try to keep quiet from here on out I'll probably do the calls every now and then but really I'll just be on the lookout for any large birds any large woodpeckers try to get my lens on them and see what they are these birds were last sighted by ornithologists in the swamps of Arkansas in 2004 through 2007 but credible footage hasn't been recorded since the 1930s and 40s. Since being declared officially extinct in 2021, funding for research and studies into these ivory bills has dried up, causing outcry from ornithologists and conservationists alike. When we give up the search for an elusive and extremely rare species, we're giving up one reason to conserve our sacred and wild places. So I seek to join my calls into this search in the slim hopes of rediscovery that could push further conservation efforts. If there's one thing that this Black River Paddle can teach us, it's to never give up hope and discovery in the possibility of the unknown around each bend. We have lost so many of our great species so many great trees, but within this river we can turn back time. We can revisit our ancient lizards and great trees, connecting ourselves to a time and place almost forgotten that reminds us why more conservation is such a great need. Um, you know, one other thing, I, I, I kind of talk about this in my series, when I was a little boy, um, I always heard like the legends of the uh, the Black Panthers, and I'm trying. Do you, have y'all? Do y'all know anything great about? I have story for you. Yeah, perfect. Right. You're the I, right guy. I, um, like I said, I work at Wing Y'all Generating Station, right up here in Maryville. We have just like this all through there. Well, uh, some days we'll have to ride around the dike and you know check the pumps and stuff like that. Well, one day me and four of my friends, we were all working together on a little buggy, like a little side by side. And it's the first one I've ever seen. My mom has told me about them from her being a kid out here. But it walked out, and they say the tail, if you see it, the tail is exactly as long as the body. That's a, that's the thing, okay? yep. And it, we're coming up, and I mean, we're a good ways. We're probably 300 foot off away from it. But it's standing right there just in, at the edge of the creek, drinking. And it turns and picks its head up at us, and its tail is just back there dancing, just doing like this. And it turns and looks at us. And I mean, it just slowly just walks off, steps off, and it's gone. Oh, they shit. are real. <laughs> y'all as well. It was, it was good to meet y'all. That's the thing about the river, you know? It's like the way things work. Now, whether you're a believer in the mythic Carolina Black Panther, or these kind of stories make you cringe, I can tell you that we have no evidence that they exist here. Now, when I talk about Black Panthers, I'm not talking about a melanistic cougar, but I'm talking about Panthera, a melanistic jaguar. Jaguar are common in South and Central America, and they even have been known to range into Texas. If we could go back 200 years, there were jaguar in these swamps. And so the idea that at one point in time there was a black panther is likely true. However, with all of the trail cameras across the state, 
we have no shots, no images of the Carolina Panther here any longer. But I can tell you from my experience that there is a large, silent, and deadly predator hidden within these swamps. Let's go see this gator. And now when I paddled up earlier, this guy actually shot out after me and was following me. He gave me kind of a spook. And I thought maybe it's either a beaver or a gator. And I was right, it was a gator. Luckily it's a cold day and so he is just resting. But I'm gonna get a little bit closer. Try to get a better shot of him. But if he moves, I'm gonna be paddling like crazy, so. Oh shit. I don't wanna be making noise. I don't wanna be doing anything that would spook this gator. I want to have my ax ready. Like that's gonna do any good. Let's see how close we can get. I'm just kidding y'all. This was not an alligator attack. This is the way that a worst case scenario could play out. You in the water panicking with a large alligator. If indeed you are the subject of an alligator attack, as I have been many times throughout my life, you want to either get away as quickly as you can or you want to scare the alligator away. First off, this alligator was launching itself into the water out of fear. It sought to get away from me. Typically, when around large alligators, you want to give them some space and they will leave you be. I've had my kayak bumped up out of the water after paddling over a sleeping gator in the middle of the night I've had one launch out at me at our pond as a boy, only to have it scared off by our loyal lab. I've seen a 12-foot monster slowly slide into the water 10 feet in front of me in a tiny rice canal with no way to turn around. And I've had a massive 14-foot ancient rise up on Wamba and follow me for over 100 feet. 99% of the time, even the biggest of these apex predators want nothing to do with you. But I have seen them reassess the situation once in the water, and I've seen how they can launch themselves, feet out of the water to snap down their prey. If you find yourself spooking a large alligator into the water, find the quickest and calmest way out of the situation. But if you feel that that alligator is going to reassess and look at you as prey, then you need to find a way to scare that alligator away. In my attempt to turn around in this small creek, I thumped into the bank. I was sitting on the tail of my kayak, in my stupid style, with the camera sitting in my seat. I decided to use this technique, the paddle slap. A beaver clap, which delivers a loud percussive force that the alligators are sensitive to. Slap your paddle down parallel to the water as hard as you can to create an ear hammering clap. This will drive even the boldest alligators away so you can paddle free. Let me be clear though, that in most situations, 
And with the more common smaller alligators, absolutely no worry is necessary. Just don't get crazy and try to get so close to them as me. They'd rather we just leave them be. Right here we've got the prints of a gator, the belly slide right there where it's flattened out. We go farther up. There's the tail slide right there. And so there is a gator somewhere in this hole. Really? See him? I don't see him, but I know he's in there. <laughs> That's his belly slide right there. You can see where his tail's been dragging. The story of Kelly is supposedly now, I've heard multiple stories. Kelly was being chased. Now he was either being chased by the British or he was being chased by the Yankees during the war between the states or else. He was simply a convict who was being chased by law enforcement. Well, it seems that Kelly found this cave to get away. And so supposedly he went into this cave, crawled through it, none of the people chasing him would go in after him, and he came out the other side and got away. Well, I'll tell you firsthand, there is no other end to this cave. It narrows down to nothing about 50 feet up in there, because I've been in there. <laughs> and and luckily there was no alligator in there when I went in there years ago. But this is what I remember as being one of three openings to Kelly's cave on this limestone. All right. You know. You let Rucker talk you into going in there? I'll squat in there. It's not that bad. It'll be definitely muddy, but, uh... Let's see, where... Because I want to say you can go both ways. Primarily, I want to say left. I'm going to, um... It's been a long time since I've been in there. Take this headlamp. All right, so... Years ago, Dr. Drucker went up in there about 50 feet. I'm gonna go up in there maybe eight feet or less. <laughs> but there are very obviously tracks of some sort of critter. Y'all see those? Mm -hmm. We have not been in there. Those might be otter, raccoon. Um, they're three-toed actually, that's weird. I don't see a belly track, so I don't think this is an alligator den. Look at that, y'all. Hear the dripping of the limestone, the water coming out? All right. I'm gonna do a crab walk. Oh, it goes, it goes up multiple ways. Yeah. Man, this, this flashlight must be uh, out of batteries. I'm gonna use the phone. I wonder what these tracks are. You know, it does. You can flood. only get into this at ultra low water level. Otherwise, it's flooded. All right, y'all. So I'm in a cave. What's up? The That's only cave we got in Williamsburg County. The only cave you can crawl into. But, um,. I'm a little nervous because what if it collapses? Oh. I can see something way in there.
Can I be like Marlon Perkins talking about Jim going into the cave? I swear. It's Black River. You know what? We can go across now. I remember in this moment seeing this giant log trying to climb up on top of it. I was waist deep in the mud, sinking deeper. Every branch I would grab onto would break. I knew how many miles we had to go. How many more of these obstacles lie between us and our next landing, our next campsite. The stress, but also the physical exertion. When you're out this far, you have no other option but to keep this going, to keep forging ahead. You know that there's a dozen trees behind you and an unknown number ahead of you. And so we just kept pushing and pushing. I had a dog with me, hundreds of pounds of camping gear, video gear, but we had to make it work. It certainly wasn't the most glorious looking expedition as my trash bags were snagged most of the time, but it worked. We made it work. There is something revealed in the human spirit when you accomplish a feat, something that's difficult. When you place yourself upon a path, a journey, a paddle, with a destination that you must reach. Working these kayaks over so many fallen trees was so physically exhausting, but it was mentally exhilarating. When you push yourself through struggle, hardship, what you find on the other side of that log is something so much greater. Every mile down this river towards our goal was a mile of learning and growth. But my thought is that generationally, you know, we get school classes, summer camps of, of kids coming out here of, of all ethnicities uh, together, right? Um, and we talk to them about the messages and, and what we're trying to do and protecting this place 20 years from now we might not see litter because we might have a population that respects it it's a nice thought, it's a nice thought and i feel like it's very far-fetched right but i feel like that's kind of the only hope we have uh like david attenborough he put out a, a documentary last year yeah. and he talks about his lifetime and and all the damage that's been done throughout his lifetime and that, incredible to listen to that man talk. Yes. But that documentary is so, I mean, just when he puts those numbers up, right, between each segment, it's so disheartening. And I want to do a similar thing. I want to do a similar production here in Georgetown County. Talk about the acreage we've lost within my lifetime, the which is not that long, but you know, the acreage we've lost we've or the acreage we've developed to the get all these stats and talk about it in a way to let people understand that we do need to be a little more careful in how we manage it. As we found our campsite, started to unpack and started a fire, this thought continued to weigh upon my mind. How do we do a better job at protecting and managing our wild places. We are currently living through the greatest migration event that our nation has ever seen. A huge influx of people are moving to more rural and wild places. Current development plans and practices must be evaluated to accommodate this changing world that we find ourselves in. As I enjoy the perfect solitude that this river offers, an owl flies into camp. We gaze in wonder at this beautiful bird of prey 
that seems to be completely unafraid. We open up some cans of soup, simmer a few river mussels gathered right by the camp, and enjoy the fruits of a long and hard day full of adventurous accomplishments and lessons learned along the way. Yeah, it's gonna look good. We'll campsite out here on the Black River. Got an awesome fire. Got some river mussels. Some cans of soup. We're eating good. Mm -hmm.